Um, the talk today is about POS devices and the little terminals that you use to pay. And I've started this research like four years ago, and I was not supposed to disclose any information while I was researching this thing. So every presentation I've done about it, um, slowly over the years, it was only behind closed doors. So you are the audience who are going to see this, and um, this video is going to be released as far as I know. <laughs> um, the reason why this is true now is because I had the chance almost a year ago to sit down with all the acquirers, the banks, the payment processors, the financial institutions that are involved with it, and um, the OS um, manufacturers for these little devices, and I said, these are the problems, you need to do something about it. Um, as far as I know, they've taken steps over the years, um, they've fixed a lot of these things. Um, some of them are not fixed just yet, because it's very difficult to fix them. Um, but I'm going to give you a general idea of um, how these things work and um, how you can be a hacker by just using your finger in most of the cases in this presentation. Um, so, my name is Greg. I work for this company. I'm not here to talk about my company. I'm here to um, talk about hacking because this is a hacking conference. And um, given the opportunity, I would like to say a few, uh, to, for, to give you like a small introduction about myself. So basically, uh, this is not how I go to work. This, I'm not one of these. These are not my casual Fridays. I consider myself to be one of these, but the good guys, because I've never had problems with these guys. Um, I've actually helped them many times to solve cases. Um, I've even worked with these guys to do some really nice, nice stuff, but obviously I cannot talk about it. You can find me afterwards. Um, I'm also the uh, main organizer for B-Sides Athens, so anyone of you uh, familiar with B-Sides events, security B-Sides events, um, and who wants to go to Athens next year, you can, you're more than welcome to come and or submit a talk um, to the event. So, having said all that, um, this is the agenda for today. <coughs> point, of, uh, point of sales, point of interaction devices, lock and unlock devices, how to never pay again for a transaction. Actually, you can go do a transaction and actually not pay for it. Um, how to pay with someone else's card. That's very easy to do. Um, how to get paid instead of paying. I'm going to talk to you and introduce you to virtual terminals and how do they work. Um, the outcome of a threat modeling exercise. Um, how to become a billionaire uh, overnight, basically, um, if you want to know that. Um, and we're going to end up with questions and answers. <coughs> So, point of interaction devices, right? Um, you probably have used one of these um, devices, those chip and pin devices, right? Is there anyone in the room who hasn't, have never used one? Anyone? No, see, everybody has, okay. So when you get your card from the bank, it says that you need um, to remember your pin because you need it in order to make transactions. And also you need to keep your pin safe because no one else um, will be able to uh, use your card if you keep your pin safe. So both statements are actually false. And I'll prove it to you. So these are the point of interaction device, right? And these are terminals in the market. There are many terminals. Most of the tricks that I'm going to show you today works across them, and some other tricks works in combination um, with the specific uh, device manufacturer and the OS vendor of the device. So before I go on, I want, um, I want you to, um, do, to have some assumptions, right? <clears throat> and from your side, I will not tell you which POI uh, manufacturer in its case, but I'm going to show you the, um, the problem. Um, and I will not tell you um, the US vendor and the combination. From my side, the assumptions will be you will need to behave after the presentation. Please do not run around trying to abuse systems because people want to do that after you know, they've seen this talk. And I got someone telling me yesterday that they're very happy that the talk is today because they would have gone, they would have left the conference yesterday trying to do all these things. Um, so, and if you decide to fly to Las Vegas after the presentation, and I will explain why, please you have to take me with you. Seriously, right? Oh, I'm not joking <laughs> here. <laughs> So, locked and unlocked devices. Um, the unlocked one have no open ports, and the locked ones have one open port. Um, the locked POI uh, is controlled by the ECR. 
For example, when you go to a shop and there is a till in front of the guy and they um, type in the amount and then the device unlocks and you can actually type in your PIN and all that stuff. So those are the locked ones. When you go to a restaurant and someone brings a device to you and there is no ECR involved in all this case, basically the device is unlocked, and which means anyone can start tapping stuff and do whatever they want if they get hold of the device. <laughs> Interesting thing is that the locked POI devices can be found unattended. So you can go to a shop and maybe it's closed down in the UK, for example. You go, you drive through services during the night and there are shops with the devices like lying there and they're locked basically, so you can't do anything, allegedly. Um, so they just leave them unattended. <coughs> um, the truth is that those locked devices, you can unlock them by using key combinations within seven to 10 seconds, which is really interesting. And once you unlock them, you can start to do tricks with them. <clears throat> um, until recently, it was so much easier um, to do stuff with these devices. Um, successful, oh sorry, I pressed that accidentally. Um, successful transactions. So when you make a transaction, it would go back to the acquirer every 24 hours. So in midnight, right? during midnight. Um, and in order to clear the transaction cash, it would take um, basically um, a few seconds by clicking a couple of numbers on the keypad. Now, the transactions are sent back in real time, which means they're sent back every three minutes. And these are three minutes intervals. Um, clearing the transaction cash is now protected by a secure code. So basically, very few people actually know what that secure code is to go in and tamper with this specific um, option to clear the, um, the CAS. Um, why is this significant? Because <coughs> um, if you were in a shop and you wanted to buy something, you could do the transaction. You, you know that the, uh, the transaction wouldn't go back until midnight, and you could basically go and delete it, or you could go in the shop, grab the, the device, and start running, right? So you would never get charged even though you actually paid, you have a receipt in your hands. Do you, are you following me? Are you, are you with me with that? Yes? Good. <clears throat> so how to never pay again for a transaction? One of the interesting tricks that you can do is to get internal um, access to the network. So don't ask me how. You saw many presentations yesterday about that. Um, you can get internal um, access to the internal network and start sending commands to the uh, post device. Um, basically, you can close the receipt, or to open a new receipt, um, put in um, your own amount, and everything um, will be done the way that you want. Because those devices, even though the communication with the acquirer is encrypted, um, all the, 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 uh, the commands that they accept, it's basically clear plain text, right? Um, you can pay an, as normal, like you would do in any case, and instead of trying to clear the CAS, you can basically delete the OS from the device. So I'm gonna give you a very interesting example. It's me and my friend, and we want to buy a very expensive flat screen from a shop. So I walk into the shop, well, my friend walks into the shop, goes to the till, has a very expensive 4,000 euros TV with him, and says, here's my card, I wanna pay. I'm next to him, right behind him, and I'm pretending I want to buy this, which is like 10 euros. He goes in, gives his card, puts in his pin, pays with his pin, gets a receipt, done. Everything is perfect. He starts walking away. I'm next in line. I'm pretending that I want to pay for this. I get the post in my hands. I click, I do like four clicks combination on the device. I erase everything. The device actually goes back to blue screen. I give it back. I say, oh, it's broken. I've just deleted everything. He will never get charged for the transaction. Because the only thing that happened seconds ago was a pre-authorization that actually the guy has the money. He was never charged for the amount. Are you with me? Yes? <clears throat> um, how to delete the OS? Well, this is very easy. Um, after you reset the device, which there is another secret key combination, which all devices have, um, basically you tap four keys in a specific sequence, and the terminal resets, displays the boot screen, Everything is deleted. Um, it only keeps the BIOS, the hardware configuration file, and the Ethernet configuration file. 
Um, the thing is that no one actually knows how to restore these devices. I mean, none, none of the merchants. So if you do that, they have to send it back to whoever gave them the device. Which means if you go to, into, let's say, a shop, or don't want to name any shops, and um, you, re you go around and start the resetting the devices, the basically you put them out of business for the day. They will only be able to take cash payments on that day, or the next day, or for that week, I would say. Um, it's not easy to restore these. Um, another set of quick tasks, it's like if you want to have access, if you have access to the device, you can see the IP address, you can display all systems information, you can see the retraction. Uh, these are the key combinations to um, delete um, uh, all the transactions, but it requires a secure code and format only the logs and the data and other key combination um, to do this. But again, now they have introduced a secure code in this bit. Um, basically, these are a few of the plain text commands that the systems expect uh, to have. Um, I've blanked out these sections here because they're sensitive. But um, if you just send this number, the post will unlock. This number, the post will close. This is when you can start a receipt. This is how you um, close a receipt. This is how you cancel a transaction. And this is how you change the amount. So instead of 100 pounds, well, instead of 1,000 pounds or 1,000 euros, you can change it to 100 euros, which is, I think, it's very convenient for some. <clears throat> Another thing, another very interesting thing about this device is that when you do a transaction, they have like transaction types. Um, there is a refund, which is really awesome. It's when you get money back to your bank account. Um, there is something which is called send the offline transactions. When it's, if the internet is down, I don't know, something is not working and the transaction haven't been sent back, you can do that manually. Um, there is the pre-auth which is that. Um, Pre-off is when you go to the hotel, they take your card, they don't charge anything, but they just check that you have enough funds for you to stay in the hotel. And there are those two very, very interesting um, transaction types, the Quasicas and the game winning credit. Um, Quasicas, it's something very interesting. It's when you go to a casino, that's where Las Vegas comes in, um, and you give them your card and you say, I want chips for a hundred euros for a thousand euros because I want to go to the roulette and I want to play. So uh, <clears throat> they acquire the, well, the casino and everybody wants to know uh, you've actually done this transaction. You've exchanged a thousand pounds for chips to play at the roulette. Um, once you do that, you can go to the roulette, you can win a million euros, you can go back and say, here's a million euros, please give them back to me. What is mine now? So when they will give you that money, they will not just give you um, some cash back to your account. They will mark the transaction as being game winning credit, right? Um, what does that mean is like, if you do that in a casino and the transaction is marked like that, basically no one will question this transaction because it's legitimate, right? But all these transaction types, again, it's plain text. So you'll see what I'm getting doing with it. <clears throat> so how can you pay with someone else's card? Um, because you don't know the pin. It's very easy. Um, when in payment states so and when someone brings you the device to pay for something, um, you just press two keys and basically it prints a receipt and it, tell, it asks you to sign. Basically, there is a secret key combination that does a fallover. Basically, you switch the device to signature mode manually. So instead of the device asking you for a pin, it will ask you for signature and you can just scribble whatever you want on the receipt. So basically, if you have found a card, you can just go and do whatever you want. You can buy whatever you want by just doing this trick. It's very easy if you know how to do it. Um, there is going to be a message on the screen saying, remember signature, but if you press green, did I say that? Uh, yeah. Um, it will take the, the message away, and it will just print the second slip, and that's it, done. You're done for the day. Um, but let's say that, let's see how to, to pay with someone else's card. Um, and because you don't know the pin and you don't want even to sign the, um, the retailer's copy. So this is a very easy trick. Um, corn artist skills required. So you take the device in your hand and you have your card. You can either use clear cello tape or you can use clear nail polish, right? And put it on the chip. Um, basically, the device will not recognize the chip. If you don't want to do that, and nobody's watching, you can put the card in upside down. Right? Are you with me? Yes? You put the card in, the device recognizes that the chip is not working, right? So 
Now the device instructs you to swipe the card instead because the chip has been verified it's not working. Right? You swipe the card, the transaction goes through, you've paid, that's it. One out of ten, we will be asked to sign the copy, but not, not always. What happened here, you could swipe the card directly, but if you swipe the card directly, the anomaly detection system back in the acquirer will see that for some reason it, you were supposed to, do, to use chip and pin, but you swipe the card. So that's suspicious. If the device tells you that you should, you're supposed to swipe the card because it has verified the chip is not working, that's a different story. Do you get it? I've just, I've just saved the day, come on. <laughs> so <coughs> it's, it's a very easy and, and very cool trick to do. But I'm not saying that you should do it. I mean, it, ha it, can, ha it can happen, right? Yes? Are you excited or not? <laughs> <coughs> how to pay with someone else's card? Again, um, have every, anyone seen one of these devices online? That, do you know what that is? Yes, yes. Do you have one? Do you have one? No? Come on, tell me. We're, we're all between us here. Um, these are jammers, right? It blocks wireless communications. Um, you, it's legal to have one, it's illegal to use one, right? Just to, to be um, sure I've said that. So, if for somehow someone ends up with this device in their pocket, they can block the communication from the device back to the base, right? Which means the device, because it wants your money, it, you, it wants you to um, um, get this payment from you, um, it will try basically three times, once you put the card, another, another two times to do the transactions, to communicate back to the base. Um, during that time, the device won't be able to communicate with the base. You know, you've, maybe you've been to a, to a bar or to a restaurant and the device can't reach the base, so the, the merchant needs to go a little bit further for the device to reach the base. So if it doesn't work, um, the device will come up and say, I need an authorization code, a manually entered authorization code in order to take the, the, the payment. Um, this is very interesting because you know, you have the device in your hand. The device cannot communicate back. The merchant doesn't know because you're having the jammer in your pocket. So in this case, if you have an American Express and you, inside the machine, you can enter any two numbers in order to bypass the proceed code. You don't have to phone the bank. If you have anything else than American Express, you just need to enter a number that confirms the LAN algorithm, which means 11112, done. Seriously? Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> and if you want to erase any trace, you can always clear the OS by using the key combination. So all these scenarios are not true because I came up with them. Well, I came up with them, but um, it's very easy, difficult to find an actual live device out there and start trying the scenarios and see which one actually works and how to combine them because there are a million things to do with them, but not all um, routes are successful when you try to tumble with these devices. Um, so I was lucky enough through this research to, um, to contact a manufacturer, to contact an OS um, manufacturer, and have these devices. I had a, a device that was actually connected to a clone system to see how the system reacts. So it was part of testing and see what is the threat when you're using these devices. Um, how to get paid instead of paying? That's very simple. So if you want to buy a TV and you go to the shop and you need to pay 2,000 euros, you enter your card basically and instead of giving them 2,000 euros, you get 2,000 euros, you get a receipt and you walk away. And you, of course you keep the TV, right? That's even better, I think. Um, um, you can find an unattended locked post. You can use the trick that is almost on every device um, to unlock it. Um, you enter your card, basically you go into refund mode and you can refund an amount to your, to your card. Um, if you're doing that to a local merchant, um, probably you can refund 1,000 euros, 2,000 euros, something like that. If you're trying to refund 100,000 euros, it won't work because probably that merchant doesn't have so much money in their bank account, right? Um, but if you do that in a casino, Ah, that's a different story because they probably have millions in their bank accounts. 
I'm not saying you should do it, right? I'm just, to be clear, I'm just giving you examples here. Um, thinking like, you know, thinking outside the box. Um, um, yeah, once you do the refund, also you can mark if you have access to the internal network as this refund, instead of being a refund, it's a um, um, gambling winnings, basically. So you're not going to do that in your local hairdresser, but if you do it in a local betting shop, whatever this is called, called it would work, I, I, say, I think. Um, how to get a sig significant discount? During a normal payment, um, and when the POI is unlocked, it's in your hand, and you were supposed to enter your PIN. Um, this is really interesting. You just pull the card out two millimeters. So you have the device, you pull the card out, and you chat with the merchant. Um, you need to wait for six seconds. You need to wait for six seconds because it's according to the standard for the device to restart and accept a new payment, it needs to wait six seconds. I don't know why six, I don't know why it's not five, I don't know why it's not seven, right? It's six seconds. Um, so you need to chat with the merchant for six seconds, the device resets, you push the card in, you change what you want to do, you press enter, instead of a thousand, you pay a hundred, done. No one checks the receipt at the end. No one does that. Um, <clears throat> um, the cuckoo example, that's a very interesting. So. If you are an existing merchant and you have a device, or you're not an existing merchant, but you want to make money, right, in the next month. So this scenario has a little bit of things, that some, a few details, but um, you're going to get the idea. Um, you apply to become a merchant. So you get the devices, you pay for the devices, you get them, they're connected to your account, and done. This is great. What you do in this case is that you take the device, you go to your local restaurant, you sit down, you're having a meal, they bring over the device, you know what kind of device they have, you've done your, your social engineering and your scouting and everything. So when they bring you the, de the design, uh, the, the device, you um, seize the opportunity and you swap them with yours? Yes? Right? So all the money that they are taking, actually they're going to your account. So imagine you do that to everybody in the local area. I mean, to another 10 shops. So everybody's working for you, and they don't even know it. What does get even more interesting in this case is that um, when I started doing this presentation, I was trying to warn them about the contactless transactions in this case and how you could do this. So um, someone at some point tried to use this in the subway in London, trying to um, scan people's cards, right, in their pockets. So it would go next to someone who had a contactless and trying to, um, to charge them an amount. That is so last year and so lame, right? They've never, I'm sure they haven't been to one of my talks, well, the closed door ones, because there is a far more easiest way to do this, right? You put the card, the device in your pocket, and you go to a nightclub, right? Were you yesterday at the, um, at the party, right? Did you see how confined the space and everybody was jumping on, on top of the other? You just go around and you dance, beep, beep. Beep. They don't know why you're being so happy, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, they, were, they are supposed to um, check this, the, the serial number behind the devices, but they don't. So we're talking about, oh yeah, these are like micro crimes in a sense, but it is a possible scenario. That's the whole point here. Like, you need to start thinking outside the box, and you need to do these things. You need to expect things, things like that to happen. Um, so contactless um, pause, as I said, it's a very interesting um, concept. Um, you don't need the pin, right? Um, if you're prompt for a pin, you can use any of the previous tricks. You can um, charge an, uh, a card um, more than once using different contactless pause devices, only milliseconds. Um, uh, between them, which means in some bars um, they want you to pay for the beer that you just uh, purchased. So the barman, instead of bringing you the device, sometimes they say, oh, give me your card and the device is right here, so I'm going to tap it and give it to you. Have you ever had that? Yes? No? Hmm, interesting. It happens in the UK a lot. Anyway, so they take the, the card and they tap it and give it back to you. However, they can just do this. Beep, 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 beep. If you have four, if you have other machines next to it lying or under 
that one. So they can charge the card as many times as they want. Um, you cannot have two devices um, trying to access the same card. And this is a trick that now you have like um, a small cards that you put next to your uh, contactless cards to block uh, being read. Um, and there is a contactless limit in the transaction, which is 30 pounds in the UK. Is there like a 30 euros limit in, um, in, in Belgium? Um, there are considerations to raising that. And there is more work to be done with, um, with contactless. Um, <clears throat> does anyone have an idea, even though contactless seems a threat, there is a lot of fraud that can be done. Why is contactless is considered the future? Why are we given so many contactless cards lately? Anyone has an idea on that? No? Um, it's very simple. When you go to buy something and you need to enter your PIN, it takes you 10 seconds. When you use contactless, it takes you two seconds. They don't care about the money they're going to lose because of fraud. They care that they are making more transactions within the day for that merchant. Do you see what I mean? So if you are going to make 10, mil, 10, 10 more billions and lose a billion, you just made more nine billions. It's acceptable loss. Yes? Yeah. So virtual terminals, this is where the fun starts. What are they? These are software. It's like the POI devices, but it's software that um, runs on a computer. Um, they're given to the merchants by the acquirer, the payment service providers, and other dudes that they develop this software. Um, VT, virtual terminals, can work without a POI connected to it because it can take payments. Um, different, uh, the difference between the ECR, the EPOS, and the VT is that the ECR doesn't work without the POI. Like in McDonald's, for example, you have like the till and the device connected to it. In the VT, you can key in the, the, the card, so you can have the card and key in the card. So when you phone someone and they don't have a device and they want to take a, your card payment and they say read out the number, um, they probably have a virtual terminal and they key in the number to do the transaction. VT software needs to be PA DSS compliant. While the ECR is only being checked if it stores credit um, card data. And um, how easy it is to find cards and take payments through visual terminals. It's very easy to find cards online. I mean, if you go on Twitter and uh, do like hashtag debit card or credit card, you will end up with so many cards, right? So many cards with uh, people asking, what is your, <laughs> the back code of my card is 388. Why is everyone asking for it, right? I mean, it's really, really funny. So I'm going to take you through a few cards, right? that people have put online. I mean, date of, um, their dates, the numbers, everything, everything. Examples and examples and examples. So we have this guy that got this really nice um, card. He covered these numbers, this number, and this number. Actually, this number, it's always down here. And also, it's a visa, so that is a, like a four and a five, and I'm not a magician. Um, and then you're missing this, and you're missing this. Yes, that's why I made this, because I couldn't find a program online that does that. So you are replacing the missing digits with question marks, and it will give you all the relevant combinations according to the numbers at the front as well. So it will tell you, it can tell you which card is that, right? So <clears throat> I went online and trying to, to see if that works, if I can do this. It was an experiment for me. Um, so this is a very interesting, um, journalist, that he actually put his card here and took a picture for everybody to know. Um, this, is this guy who used this magical red line, so you, that he thinks that no one can read the number behind it. Um, and many, many, many examples. This is like five minutes um, on Twitter trying to see for credit card numbers. This guy here actually um, bought a laptop with someone else's card, and he said that. He says that. Uh, so, so many cards, so many cards, so many cards, so many cards. Um, that's like five minutes on Twitter looking for cards. This lovely lady covered her card. So, in order to prove a point, I know um, what numbers the, um, 
the Wells Fargo is using. I know it's a visa and I know it's a debit, which means my program didn't have to look for all the numbers. It, not, it was only missing that number there. And so that her number is our one. That's so easy to find. Sorry? Yes, but it, it, you can, you can um, find the bin exactly which one because you know it's a Visa Debit Wells Fargo. That's why. Um, now, it's really interesting. I hope this works because I haven't tested on this computer. Now, you can give cards to your kids. I saw that advert yesterday. Well, the day before. This is cards for kids. Imagine what's going to happen. Um, how about this card? I would love to have that card. <laughs> um, have you ever heard of this? McDumble's? McDumble is an um, underground website where you can go and find credit card information. Or you can go and sell what the, the credit card information you, uh, that you have faced or found online. And instead of I'm loving it, they have the logo, I'm swiping it, which is really interesting. Very innovative. So the truth now, virtual terminals. Um, virtual terminals have been given to merchants <coughs> to use, and um, they were not always PCI compliant. Um, due to the PCI SSC, those applications must be PA DSS compliant. In some cases, never tested for security issues and vulnerability before the PCI SSC makes it mandatory. And there is a lot of legacy equipment out there. So there is a lot of software that wasn't being tested or it was being used without you know, being compliant. Um, so the truth, however, is that its acquire has hundreds of thousands of merchants. And its major version, so even though some of them are compliant, um, major version releases need to become PA DSS compliant. They need to take a test, make sure that everything is as it should, should be on every different OS platform that they run. Um, however, most merchants are happy with the version they paid, so they don't want to change it, so they keep that version in their systems like forever, so they never upgrade it. Um, especially if you are like a re really big merchant and you can enforce what kind of a relationship you want to have with your acquirer. Um, again, it has happened. A few big merchants were given accidentally by the sales guy the internal test version of the VT to use, right? Which is not only not compliant, but is vulnerable to a number of threats. And this is being used um, today by some. So when you do PA DSS compliance, you need to do all these things, right? But even though you do these things and you have a um, a software where is PA DSS compliance, compliant, sorry. Um, there are tricks that you can do, which I stumbled upon by doing a threat modeling exercise for an, one of the acquirers. So I shut down um, with, the, um, with the system and I was trying to exploit and see how I can take advantage of it, even though it was um, PA DSS compliant. <clears throat> so I'm trying to access the logic of the system, how it works, what does it do. Um, so. When you do these things, you are supposed to do threat modeling, which means you need to have like a repeatable process to find and address all threats to your product. The easiest you can start, the better. The, the earlier you can start, the better, with more time to plan and fix. Um, you must identify the problems when there is still time to fix them before the ship day. And you need to include it in your security and development lifecycle. And um, you will end up with more by delivering more secure products. So if you're not doing that, then there are some um, things that people can take advantage of. Have you ever seen one of these devices, the little ones that take payments? Um, one of the easiest tricks I did to demonstrate that I can tamper with this, even though it was uh, compliant, um, it was basically to change what you could see on the screen of the device. So basically, I did this. So that's my Twitter handle. So the device, instead of displaying the name of the merchant or whoever it was the acquirer, it was showing my name. Um, that was very easy to do. Um, there, are very, there are a few new devices, POI, which are these ones. 
and basically they don't check for signed firmware. They were given out like this, so you can change whatever it's on the device very easy, really easily. Um, <clears throat> those little devices, they communicate with the virtual terminal with a, via Bluetooth if needed while being powered by the USB. And these devices, they thought of that, um, don't have like a, the same key for every device. Each device has its own key to pair via Bluetooth, right? However, they did this. The Bluetooth pairing key basically is the serial number at the back. So you just pick it up and see the serial. And you pair it to your phone and you take the payments. Cool. So there you are. Um, VT identifiers. So what happens with all these systems? How can you switch a terminal? How, how do you do these hacks? There is a flaw in the logic, more or less. Um, when you are a merchant, you have a merchant ID. And you ha when you have a terminal, you have a terminal ID. The combination of the terminal ID and the merchant ID basically identifies you to the acquirer to know um, to who they were supposed to give the money. So when you swap the device to a shop, they think that this belongs to you. They don't know who actually takes the payment. That's how it works. So how can you do this with uh, virtual terminals? Well, the, in the same sense, in the same way, you can do that with um, virtual terminals as well. You can go and edit, because you could edit the, um, the configuration files and change the TID and the ME to your own, basically. Um, in the real virtual terminal, when you tamper with that, um, there is an encryption header, it's been generated, that verifies that you have tampered with the MID and the TID, that it was expected, right? But this is where software engineering and developers come into play, because they build redundancy to their systems, right? So what you could identify is that if you were to write some, a piece of software, malware, um, to change those values, you should also reboot the process that runs the virtual terminal. Before that, you were supposed to delete the header file which is stored in the system. Once you do that, when the, the program comes back up, it checks that everything is not as it should be. So it uses its internal keys to regenerate everything using the new values. So basically, you force the application to regenerate its keys based on your numbers by just rebooting the application, right? So easy. <clears throat> so there is a great opportunity here for cyber criminals. And I told them that. And it's like pretty easy to do. So what is the opportunity? Um, do you shop on Boxing Day? Do you shop on uh, Black Friday and Cyber Monday and all these days, right? Um, what you need, it's a valid merchant ID. That's it, basically. Um, first year programming skills. Um, know how to cover your tracks. You need to basically think outside the box, focus on the money, not on the card numbers, because all the malware is focusing on the card numbers and they're being tracked. Why? Um, right? If you're going to do this, <laughs> meet me in Costa Rica. Um, <clears throat> and have attended this presentation, of course. Getting the job done. You could create and spread malware that can basically change the mid and the TID on every VT focusing on a merchant, for example. Um, let's say um, PC World, I don't know, I'm just out of the blue. Um, you delete the encrypted um, header file and you reboot the VT application, done. All the payments during that day will go into your bank account, basically. For them to identify there's been a problem with that, it will take months. How do I know that? I basically turn around, I was there, and I say, I'm going to prove to you that this is a problem. And they challenged me, and I love a challenge like that. So um, I'm getting one of the test cards. There are test cards out there. And I'm making a 500 pounds transaction on that day. I do the transaction. I buy something for 500 pounds. And um, basically, I end up saying, I've just bought something for 500 pounds. I want you to settle this. I want you to find my transaction that I did today. It took them two days trying to find that transaction. Where did it go? Um, after two days, they just said, OK, you need to tell us what you did, because they couldn't find it. I'll tell you in a second how I did it. 
Um, in order to cover your tracks, basically, you change the media did back to what it was. You delete, again, the encrypted header file, replace the mid in the log file, so the transaction never took place. They will have to do forensic case in order to identify what happened, but it will be months, so everything will be overwritten. And just reboot the application. Done. Job done. Um, there you are. So this is my malware. I've actually um, created a copy um, of a virtual terminal. And I've also created the malware to demonstrate this, how easy it is. This is a simulation, again, but this is how it works. There, is, there are the files which are installed in the computer, which is there. And this is like the log file of all the transactions taking place um, with the transaction ID and everything. And basically, this is how it looks like. So the files, this is the virtual POS, which is going to run any second now. Um, this is the huge log file that has all the transactions that this, uh, the virtual terminal um, did. And we are down here. We are in 225769. This is like the last um, transaction ID we had. And software will come up now. And there you are. This is a virtual terminal. This is on the screens. Um, and some merchants. So we have like a credit card number and everything. Let's say you took it from a post or it was key in, whatever. You press make transaction, it goes away, it does the transaction, everything comes back fine. And if you go back and refresh the file, you'll see that the 69 um, has another entry below it, and now it became 225770. So it's an incremental number. So there is another transaction. So without doing anything, the malware is running in the background right now not being detected by any device or anything like that. Um, the merchant presses uh, that they want to do another transaction. Um, I'm creating a random um, sequence of um, cards here and names and everything. So transaction is being performed, initializing, transaction completed, successful, log file is being written, everything is fine, no problems at all. 816 euros, refresh the log file please. Done. Transaction 71, right down here. 816 pounds. Um, this amount of money that's gone into my bank account. Because in the log file, because I haven't changed it so you can see, basically I've just changed where this um, transaction will go. I've changed um, to whom this transaction belongs to, the terminal ID and the merchant ID in the system. So delivery methods, you create a malware, they can create a malware, they can do this, they can spread it. Um, undetectable malware is easy to create these days. Um, you can activate it only one day, so you can spread it and it can be a legitimate file until the day you decide it to become malicious. So imagine how difficult that would be for someone to identify if you know that it's gonna run just for a day. But on Boxing Day, we're talking about millions here. <coughs> um, simply way for the money to be settled uh, into your bank account. Um, get the plane, go to Malbis or wherever you want to go, and that's it. Enjoy life. Well, they, cyber criminals will do. I'm not saying you should do it, but some criminals will have a, pl this, a plan like that at some point. Um, bonus round. How did I um, hide my transaction? This is a very interesting. So when I did my transaction and that they couldn't find, is um, I was uh, I managed to um, get the boss into asking me to key in my card instead of taking my card. So I was pretending the card, the chip is not working. The, the post go fall in, did a fall, fell over and asked me to key in my card and my expiration date. You can do that on the computer or in the device. It works on both systems. When you enter your expiration date, you add to that number 71 years. So now it's 16. Let's say your card is supposed to expire this year. So you add 71 years to that. Anyone knows why? No? Computers that we use today, the, their lifespan in dates ends in 2085. So plus 71, it will go beyond that. So my transaction was backdated by the system to 1985. So I did the transaction back in 1985. That's why they couldn't find it. And it works today. 
So if you create a malware that doesn't want to steal money, but just changing the system date to plus 71 years, everything will be logged back to 1985. It will take them months to sort this out, right? So you can buy whatever you want and you'll never get charged for it. You can buy a car, you can buy a helicopter, you can buy a cruise to the Caribbean, right? And the RAM that comes with it. Um, so conclusions. Um, Security is an ongoing process, and the payment industry enforces compliance for a good reason. However, threat modeling exercises and thinking outside the box needs what makes these things um, more secure. And you should be um, very exciting to be doing things like that because it really um, helps the industry get better. Um, you need to understand that cyber criminals, because I get to see that in many talks and many uh, presentations, but cyber criminals are not better than you. Um, you know, f future experts, future talents, um, people who are already working in this industry, because it takes brains to keep everything secure. And basically, being a, a cyber criminal, you use, a, they are opportunistic. They use things that which are available today. They go for the low hanging fruit, and it's easy to break things. It's easy for me to go and break a car, break a door to get into a house. But it takes real talent and it takes a little expertise to make sure that these things are secure, you know, to start thinking how you can protect it. We need to, to do a, a lot of things to make sure that these are um, secure, but they're not better than you guys. Um, Cybercrime does pay. We don't really know how much it does pay, but some people, they say millions, but that is debatable because they say, oh, these criminals managed to... Um, get like so many millions, but in reality, if you go and read between the lines, they end up with, I don't know, they manage to uh, go for millions and they end up with $500,000 or something like that at the end of the day with real money. Um, if you break the law, you are going to get caught. And the reason why you are going to get caught is because you are investing so much money in cybercrime um, and the technology is changing so fast that they, at some point, they will not be able to catch up with it. And Take a moment to think about it. Uh, before you go, um, any of you working with merchants, please educate them that they should not leave their POI unattended at any time. Any opportunity you might get, do this. Um, it's not fair for a merchant to get to lose um, a few thousand euros on a day's work because they just left the device and they didn't know about it. Um, to stay ahead of cyber criminals, consider such scenarios and ensure that you anticipate and you can recognize such patterns in real time. Um, <clears throat> today, and the, one of the things that I do work with in the company that I work now, we do managed SOC. So we do real time threat detection um, analysis like 24 7 and things like that. So it's get cheaper for people to have real time threat detection nowadays. Um, so if you want to learn more about it, just come and find me on how you can protect your businesses or the business that you work for. Um, if you didn't know that, if you demagnetize, if you have a card and you don't, and you don't want this card to be used in an ATM machine, um, the only thing that you need to do is to demagnetize the mag stripe behind it. If you demagnetize the mag stripe, the ATM does two checks, so it won't go in, right? It, it won't actually go in, the card won't go in. So if you don't want this card to be used on the ATM, just demagnetize the back of the card. It still works, chip and pin works fine, but you won't be able to swipe anymore. Um, <clears throat> if you can't remember the CVV, just remove it at the back, because if you lose your card and you have also demagnetized it, you don't really care. You don't care when you discover that you lost the card. You just phone the company, the, the bank, your issuer, whoever that is, and say, look, I've lost the card, just give me another one. There will be no fraud because they won't be able to use it. Um, don't put a photo of your card online, right? For obvious reasons. Um, use an RFID blocker sleeve, wallet, or RFID block cards. Um, I don't know if you've seen those sleeves that you can put your um, um, contactless card inside uh, so it cannot be read. Um, if you want to have some with me, I can give you some afterwards. Um, I don't know if I have enough for everybody. Um, um, RFID block wallet is like a little metallic wallet that you put your cards in. It's very, it's very good option. Some of them also come with um, magnetic protection. So it um, also stops magnetic fields from erasing your cards. And there are RFID block cards now. So it's like another credit card kind of shape card, which has another RFID chip inside. 
Um, and in this case, when someone is trying to read your card, it reads both cards, basically, and that card blocks from uh, the device from reading your actual um, credit card. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you.